What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast. I'm Matt Wolf. I'm here with my business partner, Joseph A. Fear. And today, we're talking to Christine McDaniel for a second time. Ooh. She's actually one of our more popular episodes that we did back in the beginning of this podcast. And she's had some pretty amazing uh, breakthroughs and happenings in her business since then. Uh, for instance, she sold one of her businesses that we talked to her about on the last episode. She um, is she's now... actually sold seven businesses She's now. sold seven businesses, but she's sold one since that last episode. Yeah. She uh, got to hang out with Richard Branson for a day, no big deal. Yeah. Um, just a lot of amazing stuff is happening. She's, um, in San Diego, she's got a thing called Kindred Quarters where she's actually bringing together entrepreneurs in a house to all work together and she provides private chefs for them and it's really, really cool. We're going to dive all the And, and she also, uh, talked me into buying a Tesla. Oh yeah. And I'm literally going to go. Draw, test drive a Tesla. So tonight. two of the companies she runs right now, one <laughs> she li- lives in mansions in San Diego with other entrepreneurs, and another one she um, rents out luxury cars. So really, really cool stuff. Stuff that uh, we're a fan of. We got oh, yeah. us really pumped after <laughs> listening to this call. So enjoy our one year anniversary episode Ooh. of the Hustle and Flowchart Podcast. Hey Christine, welcome back for round two. How you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Do you, Amazing. Do you know this is actually our one year anniversary show? This episode is getting released one year to the day from our very first episode. Oh. Yay. <laughs> Lucky you. Lucky me. <laughs> You're in. So happy anniversary, Joe. <laughs> you guys are so cute. This is like our 11th year anniversary or something. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, it's the one year anniversary of the podcast, right. specifically. <laughs> so. <laughs> Besides that, that's not, that's not important right now. I totally now. threw Joe off his game by Thanks, saying man. that. <laughs> so you're back. Uh, I think first time around, I I mean, we chatted about a lot. I think we were talking about your brick and mortar store at the time, right? Yes. Yeah. Eco Chateau. Yes. Yeah. So that how's is, that store doing? Yeah. How is that doing? Well, the, yes. So um, I successfully sold it in November of last year, 2017. So um, I was a happy girl. You know, I built it from the ground up in five years and you know, that was definitely the strategy was to build a sell like I have with all my companies. Yeah. Um, but no, the new owners are amazing. It was it was the easiest transaction I've ever done. Um, they're awesome. It's a husband and wife that took it over and the team stayed and they're not going to change much, which is good. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it, it was a very good exit across the board. Good. I mean, it seems like it happened so quick, too. I mean, I'm sure a lot of stuff was happening without people knowing. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, it was five weeks. It was it sold wow. in five weeks, which is really quick. But escrow took an additional three and a half months oh, okay. <laughs> because it was yeah, it was an SBA loan and a, a small business loan. Like it takes forever. Mm-hmm. So, and I always knew that. Like Cleanology took five months in escrow. Wow. <laughs> so three and a half is actually good. But yeah, I mean, it was to me, it was long. I didn't think it was going to take that long. But so, so how many yeah. businesses have you sold now? I'm actually. So that was my seventh exit what? in 14 years. Yeah, oh, I've I sold no seven clue. companies. Yeah, and they're still in business. All seven are still in business to this day, um, which is great. And then now I'm on to number eight and nine. Wow. Okay. That could so, be a whole topic of this episode. Right? I know. I'm, 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 so, yeah, no, this this actually brought up new questions that we hadn't even anticipated asking. Wow. I, okay. I'm, we've never, I mean, I, I sold a business once, but it was kind of a cheater sale because I sold it to my business partner. Cheater. So he basically just bought me out on it and it was a very clean, yeah. smooth transaction. There were lawyers involved and it was like something that happened over the period of a month and it was pretty simple. Um, I've never, you know, flat out transferred ownership over to completely new people i'm actually curious why why is there such a long escrow period why does that escrow period even exist again it would it's only only because they got a small business administration loan which was an amazing rate it's a great term like if i was the buyer i would have done the same thing Mm. so they had the money you know it was a pretty large transaction so you know they could have got a quicker loan they could have got a hard money loan they could have i know that they had sold a home so like if it was a straight cash deal, it literally would have closed immediately. Mm-hmm. You know, you have your due diligence, but that only takes a few weeks. Mm-hmm. And then you have to record with the county and that's 30 days. So like, like from the letter of intent, which is, you know, the contra- which is their letter stating I'm going to buy this business for this much from that time period to an accepted purchase agreement. Once you get accepted purchase agreement, it's 30 day minimum to be recorded and to do like due diligence. 
So the, a month is the quickest you could possibly do. Mm. Um, but again, three and a half months was because of the banks. They're just so freaking, it's the government. So yeah. they're slow, right? Same as, same as buying a house or right, right. same kind of thing. So the, the bank's just looking into it going, okay, is our money, is this going to be a, a good investment to lend them this money and the banks just take forever to figure that they out. They come. Yeah. And this buyer was at, he wasn't working. So he had all the time in the world. And then of course I wanted the deal done fast. So <laughs> I was fully available. So you had two fully available parties, like pushing the needle on a daily basis. Jeez. So, you know, which is great, you know, so that wasn't the holdup. It was strictly, strictly the bank, you know, mm. it was done through Chase Bank and the small business administration, which is the government. So it was all because the government takes forever. Yeah. It wasn't even Chase. We had a great loan officer. I mean, I, I was super involved in the process. I did the whole transaction myself. I didn't have a broker, wow. which puts to the listeners, okay, you do not have to have a broker to sell your company. Everybody thinks you do, but you don't. And they take 10%, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so I I just did the whole transaction myself. What, what would uh, a broker, just for everyone out there and myself included, uh, what would they do? So what is that 10% kind of, I mean. Great question. Because yeah. now that I did my own deal, I was like, oh my God, they would have made this much money on this deal, <laughs> like for doing nothing. So of course they're going to find, they're going to put ads out, yeah. uh, you know, and find they can put it on biz, bizbysell.com. They can put it on, you know, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then they write the listing and they write crappy listings. You know, we're all copywriters. Oh, so yeah. Of course, we're going to write like an amazing listing. <laughs> and then they they actually pre-qualify the buyers. So they're going to do all the pre-interviews for you. So they're going to weed out the looky-loos, which I mean, I made a system on how to do that. It really mm -hmm. wasn't that hard. And then they're gonna pair, then they're gonna present to you like a qualified buyer and say, yeah. hey, let's sit down, let's meet. They're very interested. They're qualified. That's really all they do is facilitate all of that. And then the purchase agreement, you know, they have a template they use, which I just reused one from my last deal mm -hmm. um, when I did have a broker before. <laughs> I just mm. used the exact same purchase agreement. I wrote everything I wanted in it and I figured the buyer could counter some of it and they accepted everything. <laughs> and I actually had a full asking price. Um, they put the offer in at a full asking price, which was crazy wow. because I, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah. I was happy though. That's wow. a good day. So were, did they, did they approach you about buying it or were you, you were actually, you were, you were shopping I know, around? I, I listed it. Okay. I listed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That online. Makes sense. So it was five weeks from when I listed it to when I had a letter of intent. Well, that is awesome. Congratulations <laughs> on, on all of that. That For is, sure. that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I yeah, had the put. I, luckily, I was able to go to one of the locations, the one in Mission Valley, once. I think it was my birthday last year or something like that. But it was amazing. And it's I've been to, I think I was to both locations, one with you. And it was just amazing to see what you built up there. And I'm, oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm curious because now that I know you've sold seven businesses, <laughs> um, were they in, two-parter question, were they in the same niches? And if so or if not, really, like what was... How would how do you without getting way too long into this conversation? How do you build them to sell? Did you have a process or mindset going into it? I know it's funny. A coach of mine years ago, one of my coaches was like, "Christine, you need to build a system on how to build and sell companies." Right. <laughs> no, seriously. Because you keep doing it, and no, I can't say like I have a standard operating like uh, process on how yeah. you know SOPs on how to like build and sell. Like I think I just keep doing it, and I'm you know it's it's easy for me now because it's like yeah. second nature but i will tell you like what every single it, it business has been completely unrelated um most of them are on the service industry so that's a common theme and then most of them were all business to consumer so b2c that's my wheelhouse that's mm. what i'm great at b2b i did one b2b business and i'll never do that again yeah. <laughs> like business to business is totally different right okay um, not my thing interesting okay so crap I guess what was that? I know it was a two part question. Sorry, no, did I answer no, but both? that was good. No, no, you answered it both. I'm just, I'm just okay. thinking of how to, let's see, to well, build well, and sell. Joe and his wife are, have been, you know, talking about potentially selling a business that they've, they're in the works of. So I think well, I'm Joe's, not even uh, thinking about that. Oh, yeah. you were? I'm just I, thinking I think literally that's where your head was of, going. Yeah, because I guess I'm seeing there's two different mindsets, and we kind of knew this, but like Matt and I, we we have the mindset to sell something, but I don't think we have the mindset to really sell our current. We never have. Um, the like the core business that we have. No, we build assets underneath sort of our umbrella company Correct. that we plan on selling. Yeah, but then you have the mindset, which is great, and and the approach of creating individual entities. 
building them specifically to sell at some period and then and then moving on to the next thing, which I'm sure you have a list of next things. From day one. And yeah. we're even going to talk about like Lux Car Collective, my luxury mm-hmm. car business that I only started in April. So this will be actually like a record. I've never sold a company in less than a year because uh-huh. <laughs> usually it takes time to build it out and build the brand and build a following. Well, that one we've already been approached on right now. So that one I'm negotiating. I'm <laughs> on the fence. Like I don't know yet. You know, it's a passion business. I know we're going to talk about it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the price, I mean, the money, I'm just like, well, be dumb for me not to. So, so how um, did I'm you... figuring that out. But no, every every single company I build from day one, I know I'm going to sell it. So how like did that's you... my game is to build and sell. Like I get bored. I get restless. <laughs> like I have the attention span of a gnat. So like I'm like, okay, in five years is usually my go-to. Like five, it's like five, a five okay. year. It's so funny. That's like been such a recurring theme among entrepreneurs that we've been talking to is that most entrepreneurs love absolutely love and joe and i uh, are in the same boat they love the process of building something new the ex- excitement of just starting something from scratch and building it up but then they get bored really quickly once it's running and that yes. seems to be a common <laughs> theme among almost all the entrepreneurs we interview yep oh that's awesome no that's great no and that's me you know and i had you know eco chateau ran itself i had a great salary i went to europe for an entire month last year and they <laughs> never even bothered me but and it was growing 30 percent year over year which is still really rapid growth oh, yeah. and you think that would have kept me like occupied and excited but it didn't i was like do we need to freaking grow like in this startup phase it's chaos and right. i love that chaos and it's creation and it's build and like and now that i'm back in it so funny i was meeting with some of my like front like i was in a mastermind i've been in it for eight years and they haven't seen me since i sold because i was off last month and so they were like oh my god your energy is like totally different again <laughs> you're like they, they said you're like lit up i go yeah because i'm back <laughs> in my element like i love startup so is is your benchmark to sell or like a trigger i guess when some and obviously money can be a factor too if someone's offering you a bunch of cash but is it basically out of that startup phase like okay got the systems running it's pretty oiled i'm not getting bothered anymore i'm bored yeah, it's when it runs without me. It's when they literally like don't even need me anymore. And then I find myself like getting in there and breaking things sometimes. <laughs> per- but, like, yeah, I'll literally mess things up just to fix them because it's it. like I'm bored. Yeah. No, when I get to that point and the team knows, they're like, oh my God, what are you doing? Get her out so, of here. <laughs> like, that's the point. And again, it's always around the five year mark. Always, always, always around the five year. <laughs> like, I've well, noticed. <laughs> so, why is Lux? <laughs> By now, I know. <laughs> why is Lux getting approached so fast? Is it just a hot topic? or it's a lifestyle brand it's amazing it's so much fun like it's such a lifestyle like fun company that has yeah Yeah. i think that's why let's talk about that that real quick can we just explain what the concept is behind lux car collective real quick yeah, so Lex, so I started in April of last year. Um, it's a luxury and exotic car rental business. And I built it with Turo. So Turo is an app similar to Airbnb. Mm-hmm. So Turo is an T-U-R-O. And it's on your phone. And you can rent any car. It's peer-to-peer rental, right? So you can rent anybody's car on there. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, hey, I really want a Porsche. Like, I've always wanted the Porsche Cayman. Like, how do I justify buying it? And that's how I started. I go, okay, well, I'm going to buy it. And then I'm going to list it on Turo and just rent it out out to cover the payment and the insurance. And then that just took off. So then I put my daily driver of an Audi A5. I put that on there. I put my best friend's cars on there. <laughs> and so the two of us created this brand around that. And we were like, I just said, oh, let's call it Lux Car Collective. You know, we created all this branding, our Instagram, we create videos, <laughs> we've had parties. So it kind of like took off fast. And again, I, I still was running Eco Chateau, and but I'm just such a car fanatic that everybody was like, how have you not done anything in the automotive space? All these years, that's your favorite thing and you haven't done a business in it yet. Mm. So that's a business that runs really good in a good economy, which is what we're in right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I don't know. I think it would be harder. I think it would be a struggle if we were in like a recession. That's not a great recession business. So that's part of me kind of knows that. So it's like, okay, I don't want to overextend ourselves. You know, I bought my dream car. As soon as I sold my company, I bought my dream car, which is the Audi R8. Mm-hmm. And so that's listed. And it's so much fun to rent that out because these are guys that, you know, they love that car. And, <laughs> you know, I'll spend an hour talking to them after they bring it back. We'll just start talking about cars. So, uh, yeah, that's Lex Car Collective. It's profitable. I actually... I wanted it as a loss business. So there's things called a ride. You guys have probably heard the term. It's write-off business or a loss business. Sure. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. create a separate company 
because your first company is making so much profit, you need to funnel that profit into something. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, let's do this. And then it's going to, I'm going to write off because it's going to be a loss. There's no way we're going to make money on it. Maybe we'll break even. And then it became profitable. So I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> that did, I you guess need, that's a good problem to have. You but, need to go buy a Bugatti. Uh, yeah, right. I, I know, right? I know. <laughs> so uh, no one. I have friends approach me. I have a guy right now. He's getting a McLaren. He wants to list with me. So we do consignment listings too. So like I have a couple BMW i8s that are listed on consignment. And that's great too because there's no risk on my part mm -hmm. because I don't have I don't own the car. I'm only paid when it's rented out. And then I facilitate renting it out, you, you know, and again, it's great and, yeah. networking. I mean, the people that are going to spend 500 a day, a thousand dollars a day to rent an exotic car are people that I want to meet anyways. So you do know, you keep the cars, do you keep mm -hmm. the cars at your place or the people that you you're doing the consignment for, do they keep them except for when they need to be rented? Yeah, they keep them. So they get to drive them. So they, they love it too. So they're driving them and using them. My only thing is I need it like the day I need it brought to me cleaned and got like ready to go. Because sometimes they these guys are so busy, you know, and they they brought the car. I mean, they'll bring me a hundred thousand, you know, this car's like hundred and twenty thousand dollars and they bring it to me filthy with no gas. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dude, like so that. that's yeah. you know, I'm like, okay, now that I know those friends of mine, I was <laughs> like, just bring it to me the day before, like I'll have it taken care of. And, and what do the cars rent for? How much how much do you, do people pay per day, or or how does it like work? Like my yeah, my Audi R8 is going for four fifty a day. Mm -hmm. Um, a BMW i8 would be like five hundred a day. So that's about. I mean, that's about the going rate. And then what is uh, what is Toro? What's their cut on it? So they take twenty five percent. But okay, what that is is that that covers all their marketing expense. Obviously, they're driving the leads, and then it covers their insurance, oh, which mm -hmm, you, some people mm -hmm. know already that know me. My one of <laughs> my first Porsche was totaled out in October. Yeah. Somebody wrapped it around a tree. Luckily, nobody got hurt. And then, thank God, the insurance paid out because I had such a good deal on the car. Um, they paid an extra five grand, so I pocketed five grand, nice. and then I bought the one I really want, which is a white one. <laughs> so. <laughs> That was like a win-win. Again, nobody got hurt. Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, paying 25% for their insurance policy is worth it. But now I have my own commercial insurance policy. So a lot of times I'll run the rentals through Lex Car Collective directly. Got like it. I won't I won't run it through Turo. So then they, I don't pay 25%. So what car do you need right now? Oh, I know. I got a waiting list. I got, I got five friends that like are literally <laughs> wanting to put cars in. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I mean, a Tesla, like, yeah. um, a Tesla would be an amazing, I, I get requests all the time. Joe's sitting here going, please say Aston Martin. Please say Aston Martin. How do you know Oh, that? yeah. Oh, you know I bet I can market the heck out of that. I love Aston Martin. All right, those then. Are... I got to go buy an Aston Martin really quick. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. And again, those are my friends. So some friends will, will rent it. Another trick is you buy this car. And you then you have me rent it out for as many days as it takes to cover the payment. And typically, that's probably about six days out of the month. Mm. Most of the cars I've done the math on, six. if you rent the car out for six days out of the entire month, it's going to cover all your expenses. And then what they do is they block the rest of the month. Mm -hmm. So they truly just want to rent it to cover the monthly payment, sure. and then they want to use it the rest of the month. And totally. that's totally fine. So that's a way to do it, too, if you don't want it. Because my R8 is rented every single weekend. Like, I have friends coming into town this weekend, so I blocked it for us. Because uh -huh. <laughs> I go, if I don't block it off the calendar, it's going to be rented. Damn. So are you yeah. familiar? I'm, I'm sure you know him, but Brad Costanzo? No, I almost bought his R8, but I, I had my I heart set did. on a white one, and I didn't want a convertible. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, because he does this exact same thing, but he's just using some other consignment uh, company with that R8. Yeah. I don't know. He might. No, I know the guys he works with. Yeah. Got no, it. no, no, cool. no, no, no. That's awesome. Yeah, because he has a convertible one. No, he told me a story where his was rented for like a month straight. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, uh, awesome. <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah, it's a cool thing. So my question, though, back, it, why is this getting approached so quickly for a buyout already? Is it just because it's so damn profitable? It's a good market? It's not like super profitable compared to my other companies. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a lifestyle business. I think that they were just attracted to, like they found us online. They found us through social media. Mm. And so, and they already own a yacht. So we just added yachts to our collective. <laughs> okay. Um, meaning we partner with a lot of the yachts that are in, you know, the marina here in downtown San Diego. And so we use our platform because a lot of my clients, that's the clientele that would rent a yacht for the weekend. Sure. And so we added that. Well, this guy owns 
owns like Yacht Life or something. He owns like this app. And I think it's a good like ancillary business to mm -hmm. somebody that's renting out yachts. Yeah. Um, so cool. yeah, I don't know. But I have two different people that approach. So now I'm just trying to like <laughs> Um, figure out like the best way to, to do that. But uh, uh, yeah, get, get a bidding war going. I mean, oh, yeah, it's always a good thing. No, that's <laughs> what I'm working on right now. Yeah. So yes. it's like, okay, highest oh. bidder. And again, I will still rent my cart because all my friends are like, oh, but what are you going to do with your cars? I go, no, I'm, I'm going to write it into the purchase agreement that <laughs> I'll do my cars on a consignment with them. Right. Sure. But I'm still going to have my Turo account and I'm still going to rent my own cars out on Turo. Yeah. yeah, why not double dip so a little I'm, bit? Yeah, I'm failing to see the downside of like owning a, a luxury car or like a supercar because it's like Duh. if there's a way where you can have it rented out six days a month, your monthly payments paid for, then you know, like what what's the where, where's the cons? I'm like I'm looking for a I'm looking for a downside to this. <laughs> well, there's one like I'll give you horror stories already. Like there's one one of our BMW i8s which was on consignment. It's literally been in the shop for four weeks now because. When it was rented, it A, got the window shattered out of it in Los Angeles with, when my renter had it. So we had to have the window replaced, and that was like $600. Mm. And in the insurance, it was a $500 deductible, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and then that same BMW, we swear it's jinx. Um, it then um, it had low profile tires. Um, one of the renters uh, hit a pothole, mm. and so not only blew out the tire, but it cracked the rim. These custom rims that are probably like twelve hundred a piece, it cracked it in three spots. We have to replace the entire rim. What's a bummer is that two different people were like rent driving the car. Like my like my best friend, he had it because I was traveling. So I was like, hey, you know, these people are renting it, and then can you pick it up? So we don't even know like who hit the pothole. So I'm uh. like, okay. Okay, who's paying for this? I go, I have a feeling I'm going to be paying for this. Um, yeah. So stuff like that. You know, these are exotics. You know, when something breaks on them, it's not cheap. You know, of course, you have warranties, but some things the warranty is not going to cover, like a rim, like a custom rim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those would be downfalls. You know, what if the renter brings a car back late and you have another renter scheduled to pick up? You know, that hasn't happened, luckily. I've great yeah. runners but it's just a matter of time because i i know a lot of people in the industry now so they tell me their stories i'm in all these message boards i try not to read the crazy stories because then it scares me i'm yeah. like oh my gosh like, or you know or they steal yeah. the car or what a, i don't know like, you know? Mexi mexico is very close <laughs> but i mean most of that kind of stuff is covered by insurance right right yeah of course yeah, yeah of course Oh man, this is cool. Okay, this is getting me all like yeah, giddy. So sorry. Like, There's always like I'm always Miss Optimist. So I mean, it like, seems like such a fun business model, though. I mean, you get to drive just cars that you've always wanted to drive your whole life, and basically have them paid for for you. For sure. And I drive a different car every single day. It's crazy. Might There's well. been days where I've driven like four different cars in one day, just you know, just by chance. And I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Because I'm such a car fanatic. I've always been. And I was like, how am I going to own all these different cars? Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is perfect. Because by the time you get bored with one of them, then you just switch. With, and some of us switch with each other in the collective. Mm -hmm. So that's the advantage too of all of us in the collective is that we'll trade cars and the insurance covered like my commercial policy covers all of that. And then I have everybody's personal insurance like yeah. on file. So then I know because that insurance goes first. So if like a friend crashed one of my cars, it goes on their insurance policy and the point hits their account mm -hmm. or their record, driving record. Um, and yeah. then my commercial policy is a backup insurance. To protect, uh, yeah, the company and all that. Yeah, got it, yeah. got it. Okay. Yeah, in case there's lapsed or something. I don't know, but we mm -hmm. always call and check on it. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is really cool. Like, it's super cool to do it. I'm but, just imagining yeah. but, pulling But then up. again, it's like a distraction. I'm like, and I think that was the biggest, yeah, once I got approached, I think it was the timing also where I'm like, I need to go all in on Kindred Quarters. Like, to have a startup take so much of my energy yeah. that like anything else is a distraction. And as much as I love that business, I'm just like, oh, like I just can't do it right. I can't do both right. Like just, I just know it. <laughs> I'm just imagining myself pulling up in like my driveway in a Ferrari or something because I live in such a, a middle class like, suburbia, suburbia, suburbia neighbor, really, yeah. neighborhood that everybody in my neighborhood would be like, he's got to be selling drugs. I mean, <laughs> oh my no, no, no. I've do told it. my neighbors. I walk, I went and introduced myself because I go, I promise I'm not a drug dealer. <laughs> because imagine my driveway. Every single day it's a different exotic car. <laughs> like, who is this girl? <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, let, let, let's talk about Kindred Quarters. Yeah. Um, so do you want to explain that business real quick and, and how it works? Because uh, we know that you've got the, the house in San Diego, but I, I actually have no clue like what the monetization behind it is and what the business is behind it. Yeah. So Kindred Quarters is great for entrepreneurs because it's 
literally like we've built it's it's co-living for entrepreneurs so like all of us live like in my current home you know and i lived in the first entrepreneur house here in san diego for last year and a half um in mission hills and so that concept was started like three years ago and you know it was, it was five of us in the house it was amazing we have a chef that cooks all our meals for us we have house cleaning we have somebody doing our laundry like it's literally everything is done for you so you could concentrate on your business and so then I started the second house just in November, a couple months ago, and there's four of us in this home, and we call it the Entourage House. It's like our nickname because <laughs> it's a pool and jacuzzi, and there's sweeping views of downtown, and it's just like over the top. Yeah. And you know, a lot of us have really successful businesses, or we've recently sold businesses, so it's it's kind of like a, a step up on this house. Mm -hmm. So each one, but again, chef, personal assistant, like everything. So it's literally the guys are writing one check to Kindred Quarters and everything is covered, utilities, like everything. So I just wanted to simplify the process. Um, and we've been approached by all different, I mean, I literally had somebody from Australia yesterday say she wants to put, put a location in Australia. You know, we definitely want to take an international. We want it, to, I want to set it up to the point where, you know, if I want to be in Australia for the month, maybe that person at that kinder quarters wants to trade where, you know, okay, I'll go there for a month and you come to San Diego for a month and you literally just trade out. So are um, you thinking about like li licensing it like franchise model? Uh, licensing. Yeah, yeah. I was actually talking about that today in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're definitely going to offer a licensing agreement. And then I'm also going to offer kind of a business in a box because like I have one guy in Tucson, Arizona that wants to start his own quote unquote entrepreneur house. And he wants all my systems where mm -hmm. it's like, okay, cool. Like here's, you just pay this flat rate. I will give you every single system, all the ads on how to hire your chef, how to hire the concierge, you know, because we have all these systems where everything's dialed in and automated. Google Docs, we have spreadsheets, we have all this craziness because that's the stuff I love to build out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, pay this flat rate, you could do your own. Or it's a licensing agreement where it's under the Kindred brand, you know, we'll have an app that connects everybody. Um, so we can build that sense of community. And I think that's mm. the part that people love the most. You know, we do a weekly mastermind within each house. So we're helping each other. We're holding each other accountable to our goals. Um, we're motivating each other. We're just helping wherever we can. Everybody, everybody in the house has a different business, um, which is nice too. So it's just an amazing experience. Yeah. I love, I love it. I mean, it's, you're living it, so you better live I'm it. I'm living it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. There, we, yeah. And we had both houses together. One of the roommates had a, uh, a birthday the other day. So we had both houses, which is 10 people mm -hmm. go to this amazing steakhouse downtown. And it was just so like, we're all super close and it's just so much fun. It's positive energy. It's high fives in the kitchen at 7 a.m. <laughs> Nobody's bitching about like, oh, it's Monday. Like you would never right. hear that. You oh, yeah. you hear everybody get excited for Monday. We're like, yeah, tomorrow's Monday. We're going to kill it. <laughs> Does anybody ever sleep in the house? <laughs> Um, so in my house, it's really interesting because there's two early birds and two night owls, which yeah. is super interesting. So it's like, you know, two of us start at, you know, I'm such an early bird. So yeah. we'll be, we started about 630 in the morning and mm -hmm. then, but we're in bed by nine or 930, you yeah. know, and then the <laughs> other two start their day at like nine or 10 a.m. But then they're up until 1 a.m. Yeah. So uh, again, we have um, nine to nine, like, so 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. is like quiet hours in the house and mm -hmm. everybody, you know, we're all adults. Everybody's super respectful. Sure, like sure. nobody's blasting music but the weekends i'm telling you right now it's like it goes off like, we have earplugs because i'm like okay if i want to sleep at friday night like i need earplugs because they <laughs> you know and then they party we work hard and play hard which is a fun environment heck yeah and so what's the what's the big vision with this is is it to build out obviously it's a lifestyle i feel like it's something that you're always going to want to be a part of in some way but for in, sure inherently yeah, you're so going to get to a point <laughs> you know five years yes, in maybe. so definitely you know build to sell down the road but mm -hmm. I you know I need to build a brand I need to build the reputation the following um we have I have six houses so I'm committed to opening six houses this year so that would be one every other month I have our third house in San Diego in Mission Hills area because we have a waiting list on both of our current houses so mm -hmm. I figured let's just get a third one um because then it's economies of scale right sure. so the three houses are going to share the same chef share the concierge, personal assistant. Um, so what happens is it brings all the costs down on the food mm. because our same chef is meal prepping, you know, 13 meals instead of just five. Yeah, right. So it's super like it brings 
all yeah economies of scale is an awesome awesome concept <laughs> do you buy and the so, houses or do you are are they are you renting them um these are rented right now oh. um but what's funny is again today's conversation i had with the mastermind is like okay like i already have people on standby i have investors that want to buy the homes and that's yep. a that's a perfect situation so they're holding the asset um i'll probably start purchasing soon too i'm just kind of waiting i'd rather the market come down a little bit yeah. but these guys just need to put their money somewhere. And they said, hey, Christine, we'll buy the homes for you. I'm like, okay, cool. Because yeah. then you're my landlord and you're going to be awesome. <laughs> so right now we're renting. Um, and then I just put my name on the lease. And then I sub, you know, and then the mm -hmm. owner knows what I'm doing. So I'm subleasing. Um, so we'd open six this year, one every other month. So San Diego's third location will be open by February 10th. And then Los Angeles is going to open March 1st. Mm, very cool. Yeah. Oh man, that's cool. Yeah, because I'm like, I could totally see you becoming a real estate company in this whole <laughs> venture too. It's for sure a real estate play. No, for sure, for sure. And and again, you know, I'll definitely go in. I'll probably partner on the purchases. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. So I I would totally do that right now. Where you know it's a fifty fifty on the actual house, and then that person has you know, and then we have the asset because that's McDonald's mm -hmm. play, right? To you know, that's a real yeah. estate company. Yeah. Like that's where they make most of their money. So yeah, this is definitely a real estate play. It's definitely more long term play in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then the how to monetize it is it's marked up. Yeah. So like each and everybody knows that, you know, it's marked up because everything's handled for them. Yeah. But, you know, these people have spent three grand, you know, living alone. So they have no problem. And that's with no food. That's just the mm -hmm. rent. Mm -hmm. So they have no problem paying thirty five hundred a month to four grand a month. That's the average mm -hmm. for all, all their food, all their rent, all their utilities. Like that's nothing. Oh, hell yeah. so, that's, just when you no just when you were it. describing it, I thought it was going to be a heck of a lot more than that. So <laughs> no. No, 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 no. It's 35 to four grand all in per month. And then weekly masterminds. I mean, there's people that spend $20,000 a year on masterminds. Sure. And then you get people coming, I'm sure, in and out of the house. The network is just massive. Oh, my God. Because my network is sick now because it quadruples, <laughs> right? Because you're tapping all of your housemates' sure. networks. Compounds. I mean, the people that come in our door at this house, it blows my mind. Like, I'm like, wait, what? This mm -hmm. is that person? Like, yeah, it's awesome. For but Richard sure. Branson hasn't been over yet. He will. Oh, he will. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, I knew we were going to talk about that. <laughs> no, not yet. But no. if he comes to San Diego, I'd totally invite him. <laughs> so, so these, how many rooms does each of these houses have? So our current house is four bedrooms. The prior, the other house is six bedrooms. Uh -huh. um, so again, the more people you have in the house, the less the less expensive it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, ideally we need minimum three bedroom. That's probably you know this third house I think is going to be a three bedroom house. Um, because they don't mind paying a little bit more to live with less people. Yeah. But even the house with six people is going really well. Like right. I'm surprised because I'm like, that's a lot of people that's in one house people. and different yeah. personalities. But again, a lot of us travel, a lot of us work <laughs> out of the home. You know, they, we work in offices. So it's rare that everybody's home at the same time. I just I just got a vision of like the real world or whatever that was or what was the house yeah, where yeah, on yeah, MTV yeah. they all lived together. Yeah, that was real and world. They did yeah, the yeah. little confessionals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do you have a confessional booth? You should totally turn that into like a YouTube channel. <laughs> no, we are. No, we totally are. We haven't done it yet. No, we're gonna do like black and white. Yeah, where it's like nice. we're like we go in one room of the house go to the and closet, you do like a black closet. and white video of like a confession. Because come on, I mean, I love entrepreneurship. You guys know I like live for this stuff, but I'm not gonna lie. There's some shitty times too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, so let's change gears here really quick. So yeah. I know that you had this massive dream, this big dream to meet Richard Branson of all guys, and that guy is amazing, and actually present to him a check, a donation that you promised, and you finally got to do that. Um, you had that vision, you got to set your sights on it, and you actually achieved it. So it's it's massive. Can you tell that story with us? Yeah. So I know now he blogged about I'm like, oh my God, it's so funny. So okay, I'll, I'll do the Cliff Notes version of the story. So almost five years ago, you know, he's been my idol for like, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for 15 or 14 years now. And, you know, for like the whole time, like, um, you know, once I came across him maybe 12 years ago, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's so cool. Cause he's like an adrenaline junkie like me. And he's just, he's like always happy and he's passionate about life and business. And he owns like 200 different companies. And so I guess I just could kind of relate a little bit in that sense where I'm like, wow, like he genuinely like loves what he does and makes business look like fun. And I've read all of his books and everything. So like now go just maybe five years back, he was speaking in San Diego. 
I'm like, oh my God, I have to meet him. So I go, he's speaking at Balboa Park and I get his front row seat and it's like a hundred people and he's on this massive stage. And I'm like, oh crap, like I don't think I'm gonna get to meet him, you know, because the security's like pulling him off the stage. But I had a check from Eco Chateau, just at the, all it was was a thousand dollars. That is it. Cause like at the, that was, I just started the business. I, a thousand was pretty much all I could afford to donate. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm gonna donate to his charity, Virgin Unite. You know, he fronts all the operating expenses for that charity. So your money goes straight to the cause. So I run up, I grab his arm. I'm like, Richard, I'm your biggest fan ever. I love what you're doing in the world. Here you go. I hand it and I run off. And luckily I was smart enough to put my business card with it. So, and that's it. And I ran and I didn't ask for a picture. I didn't ask for a signature. I didn't ask nothing. Because again, so many people were there just to kind of take from him, I noticed, which was just interesting. You know, they wanted a picture. They wanted his advice. They wanted him to partner with them. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, can't somebody just give the guy something? And so long story, then he literally calls my freaking cell phone 45 minutes later. I'm driving back to my office and like his assistant calls, asks if I want to take his call. And I was like, uh, sure, of course. <laughs> would you like to take Mr. Richard Branson's phone call? I'm like, uh, yeah. (laughs) So we talked for like 10 minutes. He was so sweet. You know, the first thing he said is like, I don't want to cash this check. It's going to hurt your business. And I was like, Richard, like, dude, I wish I could have done more. And he laughs and I'm like, Hey, come in for a massage. He's like, Oh, I wish I could. We're flying out right now. I'm like, okay, no worries. And then that was it. Like I didn't promise. I didn't say I was going to do another check. I didn't say anything. Um, I just a couple years ago, I go, how freaking cool would it be to like write, to add two more zeros to that check and freaking hand it to them. And so I, I make this check for a hundred grand and I frame it and it was in my bedroom. It was in my office and it was in both break rooms of my spa. So my team even knew I go, girls, we're going to cut this check for a hundred grand to Virgin Unite. And I got them all pumped up about it. And I probably thought they probably thought I was crazy. I'm sure they did. You know, I announced it at a big quarterly meeting last, you know, a year ago, last January. I go, this is what we're doing. I go, I don't know when, but we're going to do it. And so they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, maybe it's going to be a couple years out. I don't know. But I knew in my heart that it would be that year. I knew it'd be by the end of 2017. And so, yeah, I um, sold the company in November and I go, I, I get to write that check. And yeah, I reached out to somebody that I knew that knew him. Um, and this person I know like faintly. So I reached out to them and I was like, Hey, can you just forward this to Richard? And you know, I wrote this short email that was like, Hey, Richard, met you five years ago, San Diego. I grabbed your arm. I gave you this check for a thousand. I ran away. I'm like, uh, like, I just want to run. I've got another check for you with, with a couple zeros added to it. I go, here's my cell phone. Like, you know, I promise I'll only take 30 seconds of your time again. And he wrote me back immediately, like directly. He's like, Oh my gosh, Christine, that's so generous. Like, and then he's like, Hey, you know, I'll be in the States in February. I go, no, Richard, like it just got to be sooner than that. <laughs> I'm so impatient. <laughs> and plus I need the tax write off. Right. I was like, Oh, <laughs> first. Yeah. But he was just being sweet and wanted to meet me in the States. Right. Like he's that thoughtful. I was like, no, Richard, that's so sweet. Like, I know you're trying to meet me in the States, but I'm passport ready. I'll go to wherever you're at. And I need to do this by the end of the year because it's a goal of mine and because of the tax the taxes, right? And so he goes, okay, well, I'm going to be in Paris on Monday. And this is on Tuesday. So I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> so I've never been to Paris, but I was like, well, I'll go. You know, and that was, so I went December 11th and he had, I, again, I didn't even know if I just hand it to him and run or, you know, he's a busy guy. And he literally sat and had breakfast with me for an hour. It was so freaking cool. I was like, this is, and he took copious notes. So he, we're talking and he brings out a notebook. He starts like making notes. And in my head, I'm like, oh, he's probably just writing about what he has to do later today. <laughs> like, he's not going to write notes about me. And then, and no, then he like, then he said, well, Christine, can you spell that for me? And I was like, oh, I was like, whoa, you're writing notes about this. <laughs> okay. And then, so we talked about everything. We talked about Virgin you know, galactic. And, you know, he just lit up when he talked about space travel. He's like, you know, Hey, I'm so excited because the first people are going in the next three months. And then I'm going to go up within the next six. Like he just lit up. So to meet somebody that's 68 years old and still so excited about innovation and about doing some crazy stuff. I mean, that's commercial flight into space. You know, this guy like pushes every limit imaginable. Um, and just to see that and just right in front of me was the most, ins- like nothing would inspire me more than that, like right in front of me. And he asked about my love life and then he asked about, which I don't really, I don't have one. I go, yeah, Richard, to, to be able to cut that check, I kind of didn't have like a love life for a while. Um, so we were laughing and we talked about Kendrick Quarters in detail. He loved the concept. 
um, talked a little bit about cryptocurrency, talked about Airbnb. You know, he really loves that company and mm-hmm. that founder. He's friends with the founder. Uh, yeah. So just an amazing hour. And so, okay, now then a couple weeks later, uh, or just last week, so first week of January, he blogs about the entire story. That I was like, and I didn't know. And they told me morning of like, oh, here's the link to Richard's blog. And I'm like, oh, I've already read his blog before. But I click it and it's him talking about my story. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, Christine did a check for a thousand. And then she did a check for a hundred thousand. And now she said, because I did tell him this, I said, Richard, mark my words. I'm going to send you, I'm going to be, I'm going to give you another one with another zero on it. So then he, he announces that in the blog. I'm like, oh my God, now I really got to do it. <laughs> I mean, I'll do it. I know I will. But I was like, holy, now I just told the world. I mean, like, there's like 20,000 views on that blog. I had over 2,000 connection requests <laughs> in two days on LinkedIn, Facebook. I had people asking me for money. It was like crazy. Then- now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the day that that blog post went live on Richard Branson's blog, the first episode that you did with us just blew up. People just started searching your name at Google and that that episode just got like a ton of traffic and that episode just completely blew up. Yay, cool. <laughs> no, Joe Messer, he told me that. He's like, oh my God, what is going on? He's like, Christine, like all of a sudden your, yeah, your episode went crazy. I think, yeah, people were just Googling my name and um, yeah. So yeah, because his blog title is like how, how this girl, you know, how you take a donation from a thousand to a million or something. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, this is hilarious. But it was so well written. And typically when you get media, there's always like little mistakes. There's editorial, you know, maybe they got something wrong, but he literally nailed everything because I didn't read it before I went live. It just went live. And yeah, I talked about Kindred Quarters. So Kindred, the website traffic to Kindred like went off the charts. People People wanting to open locations in their cities. I mean, that was huge. And again, it was just a bonus that I wasn't expecting. Um, you know, I genuinely wanted to give that money. And even friends of mine were like, well, Christine, what if you fly all the way to Paris to give him this money and you you just shake his hand and walk away? And mm-hmm. I go, that's fine. That's cool. Mission accomplished like, still. Yeah. What was that? It would still be mission accomplished. No, for sure. For yeah. sure. Because that wasn't, they're like, well, you should do this and you should do that. And I'm like, dude, that's not why I'm doing this. Like I genuinely just, I like helping, you know, I just like having this global impact. It's great to have a local impact, you know, here in San Diego, but like, how do you, how do you help people around the world? If you can't, you know, dedicate the time, you could dedicate money um, to that, to that mission. So that was just something I wanted to do. And it was awesome. And again, I love my R8. Trust me. I love driving my R8, but that like writing that check, um, to that foundation was way more fulfilling. So I wanted to ask you if there's like something bigger that you're striving for in your business and in your life. You know, we call it in our business, we call it like the North Star, right? So you have like Gary Vaynerchuk and Gary Vaynerchuk's North Star. The thing that he's always shooting for is like one day he wants to own the New York Jets or like Bill Gates. He wants to one day completely eradicate yeah. polio off the face of the earth or Elon Musk wants to put people on Mars, right? They have this North Star that they're always shooting for that's sort of bigger than just like the business they're working on or bigger than just like make more money, make more money. So we call that the North Star. And I was kind of curious, and this is something we've talked a lot about in our business, but is there like a North Star for you? Is there something that you're constantly striving for that's like your big end goal, the thing that you ultimately want to get? get to. No, and I'm so glad we're touching on this because I always used to be like more money. Like it was always like a number, like, oh, I want to make a million dollars this year. And like, but that's not enough to get me out of bed every day. Like it just wasn't. Like I just always had these revenue goals. And I'm like, it's just the score. Like to me, the money's the score, like on the board, but it's not what drives me out of bed every morning. So once we did, and for your listeners that have employees, you know, especially millennials, they need to get behind a bigger cause. They don't care about the bottom line and they don't care about money. They care about freedom, number one. But number two is just like being a part of a really cool cause and just my team of 30 employees knowing, hey, we're not even just helping like local San Diego, San Diegans with their health and wellness, which is amazing and great. I go, girls, we're going to have a freaking global impact. And this is how we're going to do it. Because of your hard work, it's going to allow me, it's going to facilitate me to write this $100,000 check. And Richard did like a thank you video. Like I, I was like, Richard, can we do a cute little like thank you video to my team? Which he did. So my girls loved it. Wow. Like I sent it to the girls immediately. I'm like, look, Richard, thank you guys. Because that's not Christine. It's not like, oh, I did it. 
Like there's no way I could have wrote that check without 30 employees that had their heart and soul into Eco Chateau. Like, I mean, for mm-hmm. sure it was all of them. So that's always, always is my North Star for sure is like, okay, how do we help on a bigger scale? How do we inspire others to do the same? So no, that, oh, that next check. Oh, that's what gets me out of bed every day. And now I'm even more motivated to do it sooner than later. You know, I don't want to wait five years to write that check. You know, I want to try to do it in like three. So it's like, and then it makes me think bigger. Okay. And all it is, is another zero. So it's just changing your mindset, right? Because it's like, now there's this new threshold where it's like, okay, we hit that now to take it to the next level. It's just a mindset shift. It's not impossible. And then plus being attached, detaching yourself from money. So being able to freely give that much money and not, and then just still living an amazing life and not being attached to the actual money is huge also. Cause I think some people get really attached to money in like an unhealthy way. And I, I was there two years ago for sure. But no, when you could give that much away and not even, it doesn't affect you at all. And it, makes your life better then that's that's really the cool part totally and there's like this this thing right where they say once you get past a certain number like a goal number that you know once your your bills are taken care of you could pay for your house you could pay for your car you've got this sort of financial security you could pretty much own any car you want and travel and all that kind of stuff once you kind of pass this like financial threshold that you know you really, the more money doesn't really do it for you. There's, there's, it doesn't make you happier. You, you kind of got everything you need and it kind of, you kind of get bored of just making money for the sake of making money. And you kind of need that next thing to move on to. It's not about the money anymore, right? Yeah. And money's just energy essentially, right? And there's a rule of thumb. There's a, that the, a measurement that they say once you hit about 70,000 a year, they, they've measured happiness and they say 70 is usually, and maybe in San Diego, it's probably a little higher, but 70. 70,000 is this like threshold that like they measured happiness in people and over 70,000 in annual, you know, net income, it would, their happiness didn't increase. So you're exactly right. Sometimes there's this threshold of like, okay, my needs are covered. I have this great life, but the rest of it's not really adding to my happiness. So I just, yeah, my, my life is super freaking cool already. And everybody that knows me really well, they see like, I'm genuinely happy. I don't fake it. I drive these awesome cars. I race my motorcycle. I travel. I get to do what I, I have freedom. Like to me, that was just icing on the cake was like, I'm like, okay, all my stuff's already covered and I have a fun life. <laughs> so that was like a bonus. So it's like, well, let me just help others then, you know, and just kind of pay it forward. Um, and hopefully inspire others to do the same, which, I mean, I had all these strangers like messaging me last week. I mean, which is amazing. People that didn't know me, they were messaging me, thanking me that I inspired them to do the same. Like, I was like, this is so cool. All right. So how do you plan on now leveling up to actually get to the point where you can give Richard the check with that extra zero on it? Oh, that's such a great question. And that's kind of where, yeah, where it's kind of like lo- the distractions where it's like, there's so many directions I can go, but I'm like, okay, like is Lux, like, does it have the potential to make this like millions and millions? So I could write that check. Well, it doesn't. Like, I know it doesn't, even though it's so much fun and such a passion. So it's again, I'm like, well, it's like a plant. What do they say? If you cut off one of the, you know, if part of the plant is dying, you cut it off. Um, so then the rest, cause otherwise it's taking too much energy from the rest of the plant. So, I mean, that's the bummer and it was, it's the hardest decision for me right now. Cause I'm like, Oh dang it. I love that business. But, um, yeah, it means I have to go all in on Kendra quarters. I know that that company has the potential, um, to allow me to cut that check down the road. So yeah, I mean, that's how you level up and you surround yourself with people that are going to kind of keep telling you, Hey, you could do it. You're on the right track. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. <laughs> Hopefully it's either said, easier said than done. We'll see. Well, have you ever thought about like flipping the script and actually like buying businesses, taking businesses and like adding some Christine marketing magic to them and then turning around and selling those businesses that you just bought? That's tempting too. I almost want to go on biz by sell and like actually approach these people with horrible listings. Cause some people, they write like a one sentence listing. Like my listing took an entire day to create because like, I mean, it was crazy because I knew that's what was going to sell the business. Um, yeah. Or like buy out businesses that are struggling and put in marketing systems and stuff and then fix them. You could be like another Marcus Limonis. Oh, down there. No, that's my retirement plan. That's my retirement plan. <laughs> 
Not yet, not yet, because I still have my own ideas I want to implement and cre- like create. But no, I would love to do what he's doing. That would for sure be my retirement plan. If I mean, I would never retire, but that would be what I would do later. Yeah, I don't think you'll ever retire. <laughs> I know. Let's be honest. There's no way. I love what I do too much to retire. <laughs> so uh, do you have any, let's see, do you have any book recommendations that uh, you've been reading lately? Um, no, you know what? Um, uh, Kevin Hart, uh, it's called I Can't Make This Up. Is, and I'll be honest, I didn't read a single book last year. I think I was just focused on, you know, getting the bu- business position to sell and selling. And all. I mean, last year was so crazy. I didn't read it all. But um, I did, a, you know, listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah, I Can't Make This Up by Kevin Hart, which is a comedian. He's my favorite comedian. And then Neil Strauss is my favorite author who did the game and who did, he wrote some amazing books. Um, so Neil Strauss actually helped with this book. Um, it is an amazing book from the sense, and it's an easy read and it's funny, but it's Kevin Hart's life, like life story. And he had a really hard upbringing. Um, and he's such a freaking hard worker. That guy, that guy is a hustler and he's so driven and so disciplined. So it's a great book. Yeah. I think at like, one time he was like the highest paid comedian in the world or something like that. I think he still is. Yeah, he was for sure. He might still be. I mean, but he's just such a, je- like such a freaking hard worker. Gets up super early, works out, you know, runs marathons. Like he's just crazy. But his, I didn't know he had such a bad upbringing. So that is even more inspiring to me to see where he came from and how hard he worked to get to where he's at. Like it was not an overnight success. Now, was that the audiobook or the print book? Um, I'm reading. I physically read it. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah, just because sometimes, like, when the comedians read the books themselves, it's like hilarious. It's like watching their stand or listening to their stand-up comedy or something. You know? Ooh, I wonder if it. I don't think there was an audio because yeah, usually I look first. Um, it had just it just came out right before Christmas around Thanksgiving. I mean, um, let's go. Oh, if he was the oh, if he reads it, <laughs> oh my god, it must be so funny. That would be really cool. Yeah, no, I read like Aziz Ansari's book and uh, Jim Gaffigan's book, and I just love the books by the stand-up comedian. So that sounds like right up my wheelhouse because I get really, really sick of like the business books all the time. Um, you know, the, they get old. You can only read so many of them, you know. So um, I that's right up my alley. I'll have to pick that one up. Oh, yeah. You'd love it. You would love it. It's awesome. Cool. So where can people go to learn more about you or connect with you after this podcast? Ooh, um, kindredquarters.com would be awesome. And then, of course, anybody's welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. And yeah. Are you really accepting all of those friend requests? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know, especially after last week, I was like, do I accept these people? I don't even know who these people are. Like, I don't know. Yeah. If we had mutual friends, I would, I would, ex- I mean, there were so many, I mean, to get, to get, to get 2000 that fast. I was like, Whoa, like I'm not at my max. You know how some people are maxed out on Facebook at 5,000. Like I'm not. Mm-hmm. So I was like, if we had mutual friends, I would accept them. If we don't have, <laughs> if we have zero mutual friends, then I was just like, okay, I don't understand <laughs> the point, but right. um, of connecting on LinkedIn, I'll connect with everybody. Of course. I mean, I had people, this guy in Dublin, Ireland was like, I'll buy you a beard. Like anytime you're visiting Dublin, like let's hang out you know and I'll buy you beer like nice. so I had all these people just then my network just like exploded and these are all other business owners other entrepreneurs mm-hmm. uh, so yeah I, I would look at their profile real quick and see like okay is this a legitimate person or somebody just asking for money <laughs> yeah I call LinkedIn like the Pokemon social network because you're like trying to collect them all you know oh nice there we go <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. And it's just like connecting the whole world and just making it. Yeah. It's, I don't know. Which So that's pretty cool. Well, I want to get out to that place, the house you're in now and shoot like an MTV crib style video of the mansion that you're in. That would Ooh, be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Especially this one. This house is crazy. Like. <laughs> That would just be really cool. It's funny. I actually shot a crib style video at one point of my old house. It was like a thousand square foot, like tiny little shoe box house. And like Joe helped me film the video and it was all MTV crib style. It was pretty funny. You're like- <laughs> Oh, you're like, this is my bedroom. This is where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually literally said that. <laughs> I think I actually had just like sold a motorcycle or something earlier that day. And I had like all these $20 oh bills and I like laid them all over the bed and I walked in. I'm like, yeah, so I just sleep in a bed of money and I just like sprinkled the money like all over the bed. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. That's super cool. <laughs> awesome. Christine, you absolutely rock. And thank you so much for coming around here for round two. I'm sure we'll have more. And thank you so much for hanging out today. Yay. You guys are awesome. Thanks for having me again. Awesome. Thank you. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you. And I hope you just enjoyed this episode you just listened to. Now, right now, before we sign off, I have a few things I would love for you to do. So the very first thing is to go find our guest on Facebook and tell them that you loved their episode with us. That's going to help them uh, just feel good about themselves, but also uh, it's going to spread the word a little bit more for us. So go find them on Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook and go say that you love their episode and maybe one cool thing that you learned there. The second thing is to go to iTunes and subscribe to our podcast. Just look up Hustle and Flow Chart and hit the subscribe button. And the very last thing, the third thing is to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast and help us spread the word more. That's how more people are going to get uh, this awesome knowledge, this, this cool podcast training and a whole bunch of other cool free training that we give out at evergreenprofits.com. So that's about it. Go find them on Facebook. Go subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review. You would be amazing if you did that, but you're always amazing. So thanks for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode.